Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Circle Opens, a podcast devoted to a chapter-by-chapter review of Stephen King's The Stand. Do you need an affordable source for Stephen King books, movies, collectibles, and more? Make sure to visit Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Listeners of this podcast can use the coupon code The Circle for 20% off their order anytime, and there's always free shipping to the United States. That's Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sarah, and thank you for joining me this week on our journey through the stand. As always, I hope everyone is doing well and staying healthy and safe. So before we recap Chapter 51 and jump into Chapter 52 of The Stand, I just want to point out that I have lost all track of time. Um, (laughs) It's just by circumstance that last night I realized um, I started this podcast in May of 2019. And because I tend to forget things very easily, I thought maybe I had already missed the one year anniversary of the podcast. But looking at the dates um, on Podbean where I am hosted, The first episode of The Circle Opens was May 17th of 2019. So this is the one year anniversary weekend of The Circle Opens, and I'm kind of flabbergasted that it's been a whole year, and it's been quite a journey. Um, I've had so much fun. I've gotten to know so many fabulous new people, um, both just Stephen King fans and in the podcasting community. And I just want to, you know, say thank you to everybody who has been listening, whether you've been listening since May 17th of 2019, or if you are a newer listener who's just picked up the book and found the podcast, um, and I hope that you're still around and enjoying it. Uh, So I just want to say thank you to everybody for listening, because there is no podcast if there's nobody out there listening. So I truly appreciate every single one of you. Thank you to everybody who's left a rating or review for me, everybody who sent me an email, um, either to talk about the podcast or talk about the books. Um, I'm truly, truly, truly appreciative of everybody. So thank you for letting this podcast continue. And who knows? uh, The book, uh, we have about 27 chapters left to go. Who knows what's going to happen? I'm still not entirely sure what I'm doing after we finish this book and um, where this podcast will go, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. So with that being said, let's recap last week in Chapter 51. Larry and Leo finally meet Harold, and Leo is immediately wary of him. After Dick Ellis drops out of the ad hoc committee to focus on medical care for the community, Stu asks Larry to join the committee. The committee then have their first meeting, where they come to several agreements about how to proceed with the burial of the dead in Boulder, as well as keeping Mother Abigail in the loop about their discussions, especially where the dark man is concerned. The committee decides to send three scouts out west to spy on Randall Flagg, those three being Judge Ferris, Dana Jurgens, and Tom Cullen. Fran also discovers a chocolate-smeared thumbprint in her diary, and she comes to the conclusion that Harold may have read her journal. So we start chapter 52 with Mother Abigail, who cannot sleep. She is trying to pray, but feels like God is not there. She says, Show me my sin, Lord. I don't know. I know I've been gone and missed something you meant for me to see. I can't sleep. I can't take a crap. And I don't feel you, Lord. I feel like I'm praying into a dead phone, and this is a bad time for that to happen. How have I offended thee? I'm listening, Lord, listening for the still, small voice in my heart. And then she seems to have a vision of herself on a dirt road and a sea of corn surrounded by weasels as she holds her sack of freshly killed chickens. As the weasels scatter, a figure comes out of the corn, a huge rocky mountain timber wolf, its jaws hanging open in a sardonic grin, its eyes burning. There was a beaten silver collar around its thick neck a thing of handsome, barbarous beauty, and from it dangled a small stone of blackest jet, and in the center was a small red flaw, like an eye, or a key. The wolf tells her that they're coming for her, that he is all the things that she thinks, and more. He is the magic man. 
Abigail says he has no power over her, but the wolf says that God's vessel is weak. And when the mouth of the wolf opens to devour her, Mother Abigail wakes up from her vision, and she knows what she has to do now. So she gets dressed and leaves her home, heading west on Mapleton Avenue toward the wooded tangles and narrow-throated defiles beyond town. Thy will be done. Later that morning at the power plant, Stu is with Nick when Glenn bursts in to tell them that Mother Abigail is gone. Abigail had left a note. It reads, I must be gone a bit now. I've sinned and presumed to know the mind of God. My sin has been pride, and he wants me to find my place in his work again. I will be with you again soon, if it is God's will. Signed, Abby Fremantle. Stu, Nick, and Glenn are not sure what to do. Stu wants to look for Abigail because he doesn't want to leave an old woman to die from exposure, but Nick thinks it's pointless. If she wanted to leave, are they going to drag her back in chains? Nick points out that Mother Abigail is not just any old woman. She is Mother Abigail, and around here, she's the Pope. If the Pope decides he has to walk to Jerusalem, do you argue with him if you're a good Catholic? Stu doesn't think that it's the same thing, but Nick disagrees. He says, yes, it is the same thing. It is. At least that's how the people in the free zone are going to see it. Stu, are you prepared to say for sure that God didn't tell her to go out into the bushes? Really, all they can do is hope that she's all right. Fran has no idea that Mother Abigail has gone. She's in the library researching gardening and plants when Shirley Hammett, the older woman who had been traveling with Sue and Dana, approaches her to talk about Mother Abigail's disappearance. This, of course, takes Fran by surprise, and she is immediately distracted. Shirley tells Fran that she'll be voting for Fran to stay in the committee, but Fran isn't even sure she wants the job. Coming so soon, after their meeting last night, the old woman's disappearance struck her around her heart with a kind of superstitious dread. She didn't like not being able to pass on their major decisions, like the one to send people west, Mother Abigail, for judgment. With her gone... Fran felt too much of the responsibility on her own shoulders. When Fran gets home, she finds Stu gone. He left behind a note saying that he was with Ralph and Harold, and he would be back by 9.30. He tells her not to worry. But Fran does worry, because she knows Harold read her diary. And now she's imagining Harold sneaking up on Stu and doing something terrible to him. But Fran also knows that Harold's home will be deserted until about 9.30 that night, so she decides to go sneak around. She thinks maybe, um, what will that do exactly? Will it set her mind at ease? But maybe Stu will be there with Harold and Ralph, and she'll be able to see for herself that Stu is okay. Stu did tell her not to worry, but Fran worries. She saw the thumbprint in her diary. That thumbprint in her diary meant there was worry, because a man who would steal your diary and pilfer your thoughts was a man without much principle or scruple. A man like that might creep up behind someone he hated and give a push off a high place or use a rock or a knife or a gun. But if Harold did a thing like that, he would be through in Boulder. What could he do then? But Fran knew what then. She didn't know if Harold was the sort of man she had hypothesized. Not yet, not for sure. But she knew in her heart that there was a place for people like that now. Oh yes, indeedy. So, Fran heads off to Harold's, and she finds the house empty and locked. Of course, she finds that odd, because back in the day, sure, lock your doors, but now, no one is going to steal your TV or your stereo or your jewels. All that stuff was free. So why did Harold need to lock his door? Fran is about to leave when she sees the cellar windows, and they are not locked. They're just above ground level, and she's able to slide inside of one of them into the basement. There's not much in the basement, but for some toys and an air hockey game, where Harold is keeping his Coca-Cola. The room seems to have been set up for children, and it says that she suddenly felt sadder than she had since, well, since she couldn't remember to tell the truth. She had been through shocks and fear and outright terror and a perfect numbing savagery of grief, but this deep and aching sadness was something new. With it came a sudden wave of homesickness for a gunquit, for the ocean, for the good main hills and pines. For no reason at all, she suddenly thought of Gus, 
the parking lot attendant at the Gunquit Public Beach, and for a moment she thought her heart would break with loss and sorrow. What was she doing here, poised between the plains and the mountains that broke the country in two? It wasn't her place. She didn't belong here. Of course, Fran feels like crying, but she holds it together. She is not going to cry in Harold's basement of all places. So Fran makes her way upstairs. She's feeling a bit spooked, but there's nothing there. Everything is so dark. So dark that it makes her uneasy. Fran sits down on the fireplace hearth and feels one of the stones shift beneath her. She's just about to get up and check it out when someone knocks at the door. This terrifies her, and she waits, paralyzed, thankful that the shades are down. The knock comes again, and a woman's voice calls out, asking if anyone is home. They even try the doorknob, making Fran thankful that Harold locks his doors. At last, the woman leaves, and Fran rushes to the window to see Nadine Cross, climbing onto her Vespa, to leave. Fran is definitely shaken now by the experience. She even pees her pants, which King thought to tell us. (laughs) And Fran begins to cry. Five minutes later, she's just too nervous to snoop around now, and she boosts herself back through the cellar window with a wicker chair. Fran gets back on her bike and heads home, where she opens her diary to the smudged thumbprint, wishing for Stu to be home. And where is Stu? Well, he is with Ralph and Harold. They came around Stu's apartment after lunch to ask him to search for Mother Abigail with them. Ralph is just heartsick over her disappearance. Stu tells them that they can't force her to come back if she doesn't want to, but Harold had an idea. Harold can see Nick's point and Glenn's. They recognize that the Free Zone views Mother Abigail as a theocratic symbol, an earthly symbol of a covenant made with God, like Holy Communion or sacred cows. Cows who can do whatever they want, cause traffic jams, walk into stores, or leave altogether. Harold says, Most of those cows are sick, Stu. They're always near the point of starvation. Some are tubercular. And all because they're an aggregate symbol. The people are convinced God will take care of them, just as our people are convinced God will take care of Mother Abigail. But I have my own doubts about a God that says it's right to let a poor dumb cow wander around in pain. It seems like Harold is comparing Mother Abigail to a poor dumb cow. But Harold thinks that if they get on their cycles and they spend the afternoon checking the west side of Boulder... They can keep in touch by walkie-talkie if they stay close enough. If they find her, they can ask her if she wants anything, like a ride back to town, and then they can keep tabs on her. Stu thinks it's a good idea, and he leaves that note for Fran, the note that Fran got before cycling to Harold's. But as he scribbled the note, he kept feeling an urge to look back over his shoulder at Harold to see what Harold was doing while Stu wasn't looking, and what expression might be in Harold's eyes. At a quarter to seven, Harold is heading back to Boulder from Nederland. He had asked for the road between the two towns for a reason, mostly because he considered that the least likely area where Mother Abigail would be found. And he has plans. He, Ralph, and Stu are doing their best to stay in touch, which usually means yelling into their walkie-talkies. Harold really does hate both Stu and Ralph, but he's doing his best to put on a friendly facade. Stu asked Harold to come down to Chattaqua, and I might have said that completely wrong. If I did, I apologize. (laughs) And it's there that they wait for Ralph. Harold thinks Stu just loves giving orders. And, well, Harold might have something for Stu. Harold agrees to meet him there in 15 minutes. He turns off the walkie-talkie and pulls out of his jacket a Wesson 38. The pistol was fully loaded and heavy in his hands, as if it realized its purposes were grave ones. Death, destruction, assassination. Tonight. Yes, Harold had initiated the search on the chance that he might be alone with Stu long enough to do it. Now it looked like he would have that chance. The trip had served another purpose as well. He hadn't meant to go all the way to Nederland, but it did take him west, and he understood the phenomena of gravity. On his way to Nederland, moving west, moving up, feeling the air grow chillier, seeing the thunderheads slowly piling up around the still higher peaks far beyond Nederland, Harold had felt that process begin in himself. He was approaching the point of balance, and not far beyond that, he would reach the point of shift. He was the steel slug, just that distance from the magnet, 
where a little push sends it farther than the force imparted would do under more ordinary circumstances. He could feel the jittering in himself. But parked on his cycle at the end of Nederland's cheesy main street with the Honda's neutral light glowing like a cat's eye, listening to the winter whine of the wind in the pines and the aspens, he had felt something more than mere magnetic attraction. He had felt a stupendous, irrational power coming out of the West, an attraction so great that he felt to closely contemplate it now would be to go mad. He felt that if he ventured much farther out on the arm of balance, any self-will would be lost. He would go just as he was, empty-handed. And for that, although he could not be blamed, the dark man would kill him. So Harold turned away to head back towards Boulder. He could still kill Stu, kill Ralph, and then return to get his ledger and knapsack before heading west for good. Decision made, Harold grins and starts off to meet Stu. And Stu, who has no idea what Harold is planning, is starting to feel good about him. He thinks Harold's plan to find Mother Abigail was a good one, even if it didn't pan out. And Stu even feels some guilt over how he and Fran had treated him, as if Harold's constant grin and overly friendly ways was a camouflage. When Harold arrives, Stu invites Harold to dinner. He thinks Fran would be glad to see him. But this makes Harold uncomfortable, and he admits that, yes, he had a thing for her, but it would be better if they could all just let it go for now. Nothing personal, of course. Stu says the door is always open, and he thanks Harold for helping them search for Mother Abigail. He offers his hand to Harold to shake, and when Harold takes his hand out of his right pocket, it seems to catch on something before he takes Stu's hand in his own. Stu sees Ralph arriving and mentions that someone is with him. This seems to startle Harold but he tells Stu that he's just tired when Stu asks if he's all right. Ralph has Glenn with him and Nick. Nick invites them back to the house he shares with Ralph for a drink. Stu says yes, but Harold declines. Stu notices how disappointed Harold looks and assumes it's because they haven't found Mother Abigail. When Harold returns home, he is a nervous wreck. He takes a moment and then sits down to write down his thoughts and feelings in his ledger because it soothes him. A ledger was where you kept track of debts owed, bills outstanding, accumulating interest. It was where you finally put paid to all accounts. And he writes, These are my letters to the world, which never wrote to me. He replaces his ledger when he's finished translating all of his terror and fury to the pages. He thinks about how close he had come to going through with it, just killing all four of the men, Nick, Stu, Ralph, and Glenn. But at the last moment, some fraying cord of sanity had held instead of giving away. He had been able to let go of the gun and shake the betraying cracker's hand. How he would never know, but thank God he had. The mark of genius is its ability to bide, and so he would. Harold decides to go to bed, and this is when he realizes that the basement door is open because Fran forgot to close it. Great job, Fran. <laughs> Downstairs in the basement, Harold looks around and sees something on the floor. Fran has also left behind a footprint and the track of a sneaker or tennis shoe with a group of circles and lines as the pattern. Harold vows that they'll pay, whoever it was, and this causes him to go through his entire house looking over for any other signs that someone was there, and then he remembers his ledger. The break in motive was so clear so awful that he had nearly overlooked it completely. The ledger, the footprint, the ledger was dangerous and had it been discovered? How could he be sure that it hadn't been? He takes the ledger and the gun to his bedroom, putting both beneath his pillow. He's trying to think of new places to hide the ledger. He's not sure of the best place, but it has to stay hidden. If Franny had hidden her journal better, if he hadn't read what she really thought of him, this seems to spark something in Harold, much like Fran's own thoughts had triggered worry that Harold had read her journal. Did Fran know? Had that been her footprint? He wonders if she wears tennis shoes, and what were the patterns on the soles? When he did sleep, his dreams were uneasy, and more than once he cried out miserably in the dark, as if to ward off things that had already been let in forever. Back at home, Stu tells Fran that he thinks he might end up liking Harold. 
Fran is already convinced now that Harold did read her journal, and she was so afraid Harold would connive to get Stu alone to harm him. But it seemed more logical to assume that Harold had let things go this long, so maybe he was just going to let it go completely. Maybe things would be all right. Maybe reading her journal had helped Harold realize how pointless his pursuit of her was. On top of the news that Mother Abigail was gone, Fran was in a ripe mood to see all ill omens. She and Stu decide they would like to be on good terms with Harold, and they make plans to search for Mother Abigail if she doesn't show up again by daylight. So the next day, there's an even larger search party, nearly 50 people. Being gone one night was one thing, but being gone another night was something completely different for a woman of over a 100. The fellow who had struggled across the country from Louisiana to Boulder with a party of 12 summed it up perfectly. He had come in with his people at noon the day before. When told that Mother Abigail was gone, this man, Norman Kellogg by name, threw his Astros baseball cap on the ground and said, Ain't that my fucking luck? Who you got hunting her up? Charlie, in Penning, the resident doom crier, suggested that maybe because Mother Abigail bugged out, they all should. They would feel safer in New York or Boston, farther away from Vegas, but no one takes him up on that. Resigned dread was as far as the community's feelings went, Glenn Bateman believed, because they were still rationally minded people, in spite of all the dreams, in spite of their deep-seated dread concerning whatever might be going on west of the Rockies. Superstition, like true love, needs time to grow and reflect upon itself. That night, after the search is over, Glenn and the others discuss superstition and rational thinking. Rationalism is the idea we can ever understand anything about the state of being. It's a death trip. It always has been, so you can charge the superflu off to rationalism if you want. But the other reason we're here is the dreams, and the dreams are irrational. We're here under the fiat of powers we don't understand. For me, that means we may be beginning to accept, only subconsciously now, and with plenty of slips backward due to culture lag, a different definition of existence. The idea that we can never understand anything about the state of being. And if rationalism is a death trip, then irrationalism might very well be a life trip, at least unless it proves otherwise. And maybe the age of rationalism has passed. Maybe if that's true, maybe they could see dark magic, a universe of marvels where water flows uphill and trolls live in the deepest woods and dragons live under the mountains. Bright wonders, white power, Lazarus come forth, water into wine, and just maybe the casting out of devils. Mother Abigail calls him, the dark man, the devil's imp. Maybe he's just the last magician of rational thought, gathering the tools of technology against us. And maybe there's something more, something much darker. I only know that he is, and I no longer think that sociology or psychology or any other ology will put an end to him. I think only white magic will do that. And our white magician is out there someplace, wandering and alone. The rest of the group doesn't have much to say about that. Not with the night coming in again. The next day, at a quarter past two, Glenn comes bursting into Stu's apartment uninvited. He has some pretty major news, but it's not about Mother Abigail. It's about Kojak, his dog Kojak, who they had to leave behind when they left New Hampshire. When Glenn woke up from a nap that day, Kojak was on his front porch. He was beat to shit, but it's him. Stu is stunned to hear this, as most people would be, but Kojak has the same tags, the same red collar. Dick was able to bandage up a lot of Kojak's injuries, and he's lost one eye for good, some of the bad scratches were infected, but Dick said there were no rabies, and it looked like Kojak had tangled with wolves. Glenn is very emotional, because the dog found him, and he came back to him. He followed Glenn all the way to Boulder. How could he do a thing like that? Stu says that dogs dream. Didn't you ever see one lying fast asleep on the kitchen floor, paws twitching away? There was an old guy in Arnett, Vic Palfrey, and he used to say dogs had two dreams. The good dream and the bad one, the good ones, when the paws twitch. The bad ones, the growling dream. Wake a dog up in the middle of a bad dream, the growling dream, and he's apt to bite you, like as not. 
Glenn seems a bit baffled that Kojak could have dreamed of Boulder the way they all did, but Stu points out that Glenn seemed open-minded to magic the night before. And Glenn says, I can talk that stuff for hours on end. I'm one of the great all-time bullshitters, is when something actually happens. So the two set off to see Kojak, and he is on the porch of Glenn's home, and Stu finds himself with a lump in his throat. A dog was a good thing to have, and so far as he knew, Kojak was the only dog in Boulder. Both men are fairly emotional over Kojak's reappearance, and Stu says that maybe they should keep an eye out for a female dog, just in case. And because it looks like Kojak falls back asleep, the two men decide to go inside and have a drink. But Kojak is not asleep. He lays somewhere between, where most living things spend a good deal of time when they are hurt badly, but not badly enough to be in the mortal shadow. We get a little bit of insight um, from Kojak's point of view. Kojak's name had once been Big Steve, which he still occasionally calls himself. And he had made his way following the scent of the man, Glenn, to Hemingford home. That was where the wolves had come for him. He came out of the corn like ragged spirits of the dead. They had attacked Kojak, and he knew if he could get under the porch, he could stand them off. He fought the wolves, ignoring his own wounds to tear open their throats. But the wolves do their fair of damage to Kojak. And King writes that even when Kojak was an old dog, because he lives another 16 years, long after Glenn Bateman died, those scars would continue to throb on wet days. Kojak had scrambled under the porch and stayed there. One of the wolves attempted to follow, allowing Kojak to rip out its throat. And finally, the last wolf disappeared, and soon Kojak felt the presence of another, something that terrified him into soft whimpers. It was a thing in the corn, a thing walking in the corn, hunting for him, perhaps. Kojak lay shivering, waiting to see if this thing would find him, this horrible thing that felt like a man and a wolf and an eye. Some dark thing, like an ancient crocodile in the corn. Kojak slept under that porch for three days, only coming out long enough to get water dripping from the hand pump or to eat the scraps that were left behind in Mother Abigail's house. When Kojak felt like he could go on, he knew where to go. It was not a scent that told him. It was a deep sense of heat that had come out of his own deep and mortal time, a glowing pocket of heat to the west of him. And so he came, limping most of the last 500 miles on three legs, the pain always gnawing at his belly. From time to time, he was able to smell the man, and thus knew he was on the right track. And at last, he was here. The man was here. There were no wolves here. Food was here. There was no sense of that dark thing, the man with the stink of a wolf and the feel of an eye that could see you over long miles if it happened to turn your way. For now, things were fine. And so thinking, so far as dogs can think and their careful relating to a world seen almost wholly through feelings, Kojak drifted down deeper, now into a real sleep, now into a dream, a good dream of chasing rabbits through the clover and timothy grass that was belly high and wet with soothing dew. His name was Big Steve. This was North Forty. And oh, the rabbits are everywhere this gray and endless morning. As he dreamed, his paws twitched. So, oh, I love the ending of that chapter so much. <laughs> Finally, something really good to happen, you know. We get a lot of movement in this chapter. Uh, Mother Abigail decides, based on a vision from God, or maybe the dark man, that she has been so prideful about her role in Boulder that she believes God needs her to return to the wilderness so she can serve him better. She leaves nothing but a note, and of course, people are going to argue about the best course of action. One, she wanted to go. She went of her own free will. But two, she's over a hundred years old, and she is not immortal. She could die simply from exposure. So do they search for her? Wait for her to return? Um, what is their responsibility to Mother Abigail? And what is her responsibility to them? And Harold decides to suggest a search, but only for he, Ralph, and Stu to find Mother Abigail and just see what she may need. It all sounds very innocent and like a great idea. And of course, Harold has ulterior motives. He plans on murdering Stu and probably heading west that night. 
of course, he probably asked Ralph to go along because, um, yeah, Stu's not probably going to go anywhere with Harold by themselves. So Ralph is just, you know, um, oh, what's the word? Collateral damage, I guess. That might be wrong, but it's what I have. So Harold has his ledger and he wants to bring something to flag when he goes. So first he wants his revenge. And yet his plans are derailed. Not only by the arrival of Glenn and Nick, but of Stu's friendliness towards him. He thanks Harold for helping them search for Mother Abigail when everyone else decided to let nature run its course. He even offers to shake Harold's hand. And this is Harold's chance, I think. But rather than pull out his gun, he shakes Stu's hand. And for a moment, I wondered if maybe this got through to Harold. Maybe he realized he didn't have to become a murderer. He didn't have to seek revenge over someone who was never really his to begin with. He didn't have to do these horrible things. Maybe he found some semblance of redemption. Uh, no. (laughs) I think maybe he was just a coward. Um, And I think he probably would have shot Stu, if not for Ralph and Nick and Glenn showing up. I know he thinks to himself that he could have just wasted all four, but I don't think Harold is quite there yet. I think it's one thing to shoot one man. I think it's another to shoot several. And I know that Harold is on a downward spiral here, but I don't think he's quite hit the bottom yet. So he does go home to write down all of his fury and rage into his ledger. And I think that it's a cathartic thing for him. I think that keeps him from actually pulling the trigger. At least it keeps him from pulling the trigger until he realizes that someone has broken into his house because Fran left behind a dirty shoe print on the basement floor. And Harold is smart enough to think that maybe it was Fran. Maybe she knew that he had read her journal and he's starting to wonder what the patterns of her shoes look like. I don't know. Did Harold have any chance of becoming a better person? Did Fran's snoopiness effectively destroy that? Or is Harold too far gone anyway for that to be a possibility? Um, Maybe he didn't kill Stu because he just didn't have the guts to do it, like I said. At least not yet. So Fran breaks into Harold's house and she doesn't actually find anything because Nadine Cross, of all people, shows up to see Harold. And what on earth could she possibly want with Harold Louder? It's certainly suspicious considering Nadine is Flag's chosen one and Harold is being lured west too. So I'm interested to see what becomes of a meeting between these two characters. Fran does notice the stone is loose on the hearth where uh, Harold keeps his ledger. And she's so close to finding it before Nadine arrives. And of course, then Fran is too spooked to look any further when Nadine is gone. So really, Fran's visit, her breaking and entering into Harold's house accomplishes nothing. (laughs) All it really seems to do is cement Harold's hatred for her and for Boulder. Stu seems to think that maybe he can end up liking Harold. And while Fran doesn't tell him what she found in her diary, she's still a little unsure, but maybe she was just being paranoid. Harold hadn't harmed Stu while they were out, so maybe her pregnancy hormones are just making her crazy. Or maybe she should just listen to her gut feeling. (laughs) Tell somebody about the, the journal, Fran. Stop holding it in. The free zone seems to be at a bit of an impasse. Uh, Only one person seems to want to leave because if Mother Abigail left, surely they all should. But people are staying put. They're becoming a society now after having lost it so quickly. So no one seems to want to break away from that, even though Mother Abigail is gone. They still have a committee and they need leadership. Glenn finally discusses the possibility that dark magic has taken over. And that's what fuels Randall Flagg. Maybe Mother Abigail is white magic needed to defeat him. It's all something they need to think about. And they can't really know what her role is in all of this. All they can really do is speculate and wait for things to happen. They're all there because of reasons that they cannot understand or explain. They can't rationalize away the dreams. So it seems like they're slowly coming to the understanding that there are other forces at work here that are greater than themselves. And of course, the best part of this chapter is that Kojak is back. Or Big Steve, as he was once called. But you know what? He's Kojak. And he made his way across the country to find the man, his human Glenn. Kojak certainly went through a lot, but he persevered. Conser- considering so many dogs have died from the flu, but Kojak survived the flu and a long, dangerous trip along the way with a bunch of wolves, 
that I believe were sent by flag. So what does that mean? What is Kojak's purpose? Because I truly believe that he does have one. I I absolutely love um, that King takes us into Kojak's head, telling us his story from when he made it to Hemingford home and Mother Abigail's house. And then he makes his way from there to Boulder. And at least to Hemingford home, it seems like he just followed Glenn's scent. But from Hemingford home to Boulder, he had, I don't know, he dreamt of the place. He felt he knew where to go. That instinctual feeling, he knew where to go. Kojak is definitely a character um, on his own, and he is an important one. So why was the dark man sending his wolves for him? Why was he searching in the corn for him? Kojak surviving and finding his way to Boulder makes me so happy. (laughs) I was so depressed when they had to leave him behind. Um, Being a dog person myself, I just can't imagine having to do that, even if it's for rational reasons. Um, And yes, Glenn does feel guilt from it, but Kojak came back to him. So Mother Abigail is gone. Harold is being driven further and further away. And Kojak is back. (laughs) So next week, we get another ad hoc committee meeting where they create an agenda for the community-wide meeting. Nadine also makes one last-ditch effort to deny Flag's hold on her. Will she succeed? We'll find out next week in Chapter 53. So that's it for this chapter and this episode of The Circle Opens. I hope that you guys enjoyed chapter 52. Um, I was really, I remember the first time I read this, I was really terrified that Harold would kill Stu. So I guess I'm glad that he was a coward and chickened out of it. I was also so excited again in this chapter. (laughs) I don't know. I was just so happy to see Kojak back. Um, There's just something about dogs that they're so pure and innocent. And like King writes in the chapter, you know, their entire existence is based on feeling. Dogs feel so much, and I love that he he risked his life to find Glenn again and to come over to Boulder from New Hampshire on his own, and I think that Kojak has a role to play in all of this. So if you guys are enjoying The Circle Opens, it would be awesome if you left me a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can find me at thecircleopens.com or thecircleopens.podbean.com. And I guess that's it, you guys. Uh, Thank you again for a whole year of reviewing this book that we still have a while to go. We are getting closer and closer to the last book, The Stand. So uh, that's it, you guys. Thank you for listening. And M-O-O-N, that spells. See you next week. Bye.